My name is John Moss. I'm an educator in the Programs in Education Department at the National Museum of the United States Army at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Yeah, hopefully you have visited our museum, just opened, reopened recently in June. And uh, if you haven't yet, I want to welcome you to come on down and invite you to experience uh, the Army's history. And what I'm going to do tonight is go over basically uh, the colonial conflicts uh, that are uh, part of our, our Army's early history. We're not going to be able to go into all of them by any means or even really talk about uh, any of them in depth, but there's a pattern I think that you'll see, and that's what we're trying to get at tonight is to give examples from the patterns and just to kind of place the c colonial conflicts uh, into uh, into some kind of uh, context where you can see this arc going from the early 1620s or before into just prior to the American Revolution. So we're going to start with the early Indian Wars. Those were really the first conflicts that were in existence uh, and that Americans experienced uh, during the colonial period. And these were started very early after settlement uh, from by Europeans, mostly English, but also uh, involving the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish at other other, other periods. And these were typically uh, European colonists against Native Americans. Uh, and the causes of these conflicts were almost always related to land and settlement and trade. So the settlers would come, they would initially have some kind of uh, oftentimes positive uh, interactions with Native Americans, but as the English, uh, and we'll focus mostly on the English uh, because of the, um, the, the way the settlement of the American colonies started, uh, the British colonies, that the, the constant expansion of colonial boundaries, of settlement boundaries, impeded Indian villages, but also it, 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 um, uh, it caused the Indians to lose uh, gradually much of their hunting grounds, uh, their uh, gathering areas for food uh, and, and other things that they needed. And that often led to conflict, as we'll see uh, in a second with our first example. And there were also disputes over trade. Um, the the mo Most of the early settlers were interested in not only land, but establishing very profitable trade with Indians, uh, Indian nations, Indian peoples that would allow them to get items that would sell back in Europe, and particularly furs. Furs were made into uh, hats, um, not so much coats or actual clothing, but for the most part, um, a lot of uh, headwear of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And the Indians were very desirous of metal goods, firearms, pots, things along those lines. And that kind of relationship often led to disputes, not just between European colonists and Native Americans, but between different groups of Native Americans trying to get more access to trade goods. Um, so this began early on in the colonization of North America. Uh, I'll give you three examples here. Uh, the first one are the 1622 Jamestown attacks in Virginia by the Powhatan Indians who had several villages, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the, along the James River, the York River, uh, along the Chesapeake, um, and they were pushed back by the Jamestown English settlers beginning in 1607. Now, this led to a continuing pressure uh, against Indian lands, Indian villages, uh, again, Indian hunting territory by these ever increasing numbers of, Amer of, uh, of English colonists that came to uh, America, to, came to the colony of Virginia. 
So this kind of created really a, a, bo a boiling over point in 1622. Um, those of you who've been to Jamestown, it's along the James River on the north bank of the James River. And settlement kept continuing uh, westbound, uh, west toward what is now Richmond. And in that area upriver from the Jamestown settlement itself, uh, the Powhatan Indians attacked uh, many plantations, uh, many houses, uh, smaller settlements on March 22nd, 1622. It was, just, it was a surprise attack. Um, and as you can, as you may know, uh, there were th 347 deaths of about 1,200 uh, planters and their families. Uh, so over a fourth of the population of the Jamestown colony were killed during this attack. Um, the Jamestown settlement and fort uh, that's preserved today was not overrun. They were, they were warned in advance, uh, barely in time, but this was a conflict that lasted 10 years until more settlers coming in basically tipped the balance of power toward the English uh, and not the Powhatans. Uh, another one that, uh, two, actually two here, that were very important in the history of New England, the Pequot War in 1637 and, the, uh, and King Philip's War in 1675-76. So in the, in the first one, uh, in the Pequot War, the Pequot Indians um, uh, fought the New England colonists uh, in Massachusetts Bay Area, Plymouth, um, Saybrook, and they were also uh, supported by Narragansett and Mohegan allies. And the turning point in this war that lasted almost a year uh, was what was known as the Mystic Campaign of 1637, where the uh, colonists attacked a fort that the Indians had constructed um, and destroyed the fort, uh, killed an estimated 400 to 700 Pequots inside. Um, uh, it's, it's near where today's modern Mystic Connecticut is. Uh, so the battle wound up breaking the tribe's ability to uh, keep up the war and the, the uh, destruction of the Pequot people really cleared the way for the Puritan settlers to continue to expand their settlements. Now, about 45 years later, the uh, King Philip's War was also in New England, primarily Southern New England, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And the war is actually was against the Narragansett Native Americans. And it was named for Metacom, who was a chief who adopted the name of Philip because of friendly relations between his father and the, and the original Mayflower Pilgrims. And again, this was another conflict that was about land claims. The ever-increasing New England settlements pushed native peoples out of their traditional areas, and it almost always led to conflict. Uh, I was known also for what was called the Great Swamp Fight in 1675 that was probably the major battle. It was in Rhode Island, and um, it, it was a defeat for the Indians. But the following year, 1676, there was a very strong Indian counterattack that devastated a lot of the frontier of New England. But in the end, the, the Indians, the Native American peoples, were eventually defeated. So there's, your, there's kind of a, an outline of early Indian wars over land and trade and encroachment. So if we can go to our next slide. There were a number of, of 18th century Indian wars as well. I've, I've only listed three. There, there are many, many other examples. Um, and the first two were actually in the Carolinas. Um, North and South Carolina did not become two separate colonies until the 1720s. Um, but there were two conflicts uh, between Carolina colonists and um, the Tuscaroras, First, in 1711 to 1713, followed by the 1715 Yamasee War, uh, 
mostly in southern North Carolina and, and, the, North, and the South Carolina coast over land and trade. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this period, especially in the Tuscarora War and the Yamasee War, is that um, the Indians that were closest to the European settlements often went to war against tribes further on in the interior to capture uh, slaves and sell them to the Carolinians on the coast who would often then uh, transport them into the West Indies uh, on English uh, plantations. And then finally, uh, my, my a third example here is the Abenaki War. And this one was uh, an example of, of many conflicts that will that, that we'll see uh, in the 17th century and the 18th century, where the French and the Indian allies raided New England settlements from Canada, uh, what is now Quebec. Uh, the Abenakis were in the area of, um, of uh, Nova, what's Nova Scotia today, and um, in, in that maritime area of, of, uh, of um, maritime Canada. And it was typical of, of the raiding type of war, which seemed to be uh, uh, the kind of the calling card of French soldiers and uh, Indian allies uh, who were uh, fighting against the uh, fighting against the settler. Okay, on our next slide, um, we've we've just kind of gone over some of the uh, in Native American versus colony. Uh, type of warfare, but colonial America was marked by a number of internal conflicts, and um, they were uh, not just in New England. Uh, there were many conflicts in the 17th century uh, in New England, in Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, where it was about who would rule and who was going to be able to guarantee land rights and who was gonna control the government. Uh, one of the most famous ones is Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, in Jamestown, and spreading out from there in 1675 to 1776. And this became a conflict of backcountry settlers versus the coastal uh, planters, the elites, and Native Americans. So the backcountry settlers uh, were angry that the elites who controlled the government of Jamestown were not doing enough to protect them against Indian raids uh, because the backcountry settlers had their plantations and farms farther away from the typically uh, set, typical settlements. And so a man named Nathaniel Bacon uh, became the leader of a violent, uh, protest movement where uh, he and his followers, he attracted enough followers armed and dangerous uh, to basically sack Williamsburg, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamestown, uh, to have the government officials flee. And um, uh, it was eventually put down, uh, Bacon was captured. Uh, he wasn't hanged. In fact, he was later released and uh, and and as, as, as the government began to take control again, um, the settlers that had formerly been up in arms gradually retreated back into the interior. Um, in order to prevent it from happening again, the governor of Virginia at the time uh, requested that the English send over a thousand soldiers. So. Um, in a little known, uh, or I should say lesser known episode of colonial conflict, uh, the, in England, troops were sent over uh, to help put down an early rebellion 100 years uh, before Lexington and Concord. Uh, Culpeper's Rebellion is one of many rebellions in North Carolina in the colonial period. Um, North Carolina was ver a very volatile area. Uh, there was there was little as far as government. There were always disputes about who was the governor. Uh, the crown would send over a new governor. The old one would dispute it, and there were 
all kinds of armed uh, conflicts, uh, part on land, but also uh, a lot with the use of small boats to try to establish some kind of control. Uh, they were they were usually small scale, and they they were usually about who was going to control trade and who was going to get the best benefits by controlling the government. So uh, this one was in 1677 to 79. There were no large battles, but there was some uh, fighting among houses and plantations and, and on the water as well. And finally, another example is Leisler's Rebellion in New York in 1689 to 91. Uh, this was an uprising in the late 17th century in colonial New York, uh, where a German-American merchant who lived on Long Island uh, collected a, a militia. His name was uh, Jacob Leisler. And right around the, the time of the, uh, of the, uh, the ascension to the, the British throne, the English throne of William and Mary, William of Orange, uh, Leisler... Uh, was was trying to seize power on his own, and he seized con control of the southern part of the colony, and actually ruled it from 1689 to 1691. But uh, when British authorities sent uh, forces to put down this rebellion, Leisler was captured and uh, soon thereafter executed. All right, let's go to the next slide, and we will talk about the beginning of what became known as the French and Indian Wars. So in America, when we hear French and Indian War, we think of the last one, the fourth French and Indian Wars from 1754 to 1763. But actually, all of them had the same elements of French forces versus British forces, each side having their native allies, and each side using the Euro-American uh, uh, population also to supplement any kind of British troops. Um, so the first French and Indian War um, began in the late 17th century. The last one ended in 1763. And they were really all uh, uh, outgrowths of the dynastic wars in Europe over thrones and who was going to rule and who was going to have power and who got to decide who became the next king of Spain or Austria, um, particularly the first three. And uh, the last one, which is what we call the French and Indian War, part of the Seven Years' War, um, not as much, but the first three were certainly uh, that way. Uh, now, what this did is it put um, it put the uh, British in in contact with American colonists because American colonists would form part of the armies, and so this began a lot of what what's been called the seeds of conflict. So when when Britain would bring uh, soldiers and navies over to America. Uh, it was great for trade. It was great for merchants. Uh, it was great for anybody who worked in the shipping industry or contractors for food and supplies, things along those lines. But the British regulars who underwent a uh, very strict discipline, often brutal, um, compared to the um, American troops who were not under that kind of discipline, who often elected their officers, uh, whose officers were not, own, not always as aristocratic as the British, uh, this created conflict uh, over the period of dynastic wars, the French and Indian Wars, um, beginning in the 1680s, and eventually would lead to uh, uh, things along the line, well, things such as the Boston Massacre and powder alarms and things like that right before the revolution uh, that kind of, kind of those seeds were sown early in, in, these, in these dynastic wars. Uh, okay, so before we go on, uh, let me remind you to please put questions in the Q&A and not the chat. Um, I won't be able to answer any questions from the chat, so please feel free to uh, 
transfer them to the Q and A. All right, let's go to our next slide. All right, the first of these dynastic wars, French and Indian Wars, was King William's War, from 1689 to 97. Now, all four of these wars had names in Europe that were different than American names, but the Americans tended to remember these wars by who was king at the time. So there was King William's War, followed by Queen Anne's War, then there was King George's War. Uh, the French and Indian War was actually known in Europe as the uh, Seven Years' War. But King William's War largely uh, known as the War of the Grand Alliance or the League of Augsburg. And the key element of this was the fur trade. Again, furs were extremely valuable in the 17th and 18th century. And so the, the fur trade was really, um, uh, was really the first of these that involved, that were outgrowths of a European conflict. So in this war in Europe, William III, William of Orange, uh, was fighting King Louis XIV of France uh, over the English throne because uh, Louis XIV was a supporter of James II, who was Catholic, and he wanted James II to occupy the throne, not William III, who was uh, a Protestant monarch. Uh, as you can see, the other European nations, uh, countries, kingdoms, monarchies, uh, uh, republics, they joined in and allied with England. Um, the French in America uh, began to uh, see a, do a, have a familiar pattern whereby French raiding parties would come down against the New York frontier, which was basically ended at, at where Albany and Schenectady uh, are today, and, and Albany at the time, and also would raid from Arcadia, which is now Nova Scotia, into what is now Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. And so they, a lot of these raids were devastating. And interestingly, the French and, the Native Amer and their Native American allies uh, the Abenaki in this case, were very good at winter warfare, whereas the colonists tended to um, uh, erect blockhouses and small log forts and what have you, uh, but not they were not as good at winter warfare that the French and their Indian allies were, and it served the, the French very well. Um, excuse me. However, Massachusetts got together a, a force of about 2,500 men to attack, to attack Quebec in 1690, led by Sir William Phipps, but that failed. Um, the Native Americans fought on both sides. Um, neither of the two European belligerents kept any new territory in America. So in that way, it was, it was uh, inconclusive, uh, but Nova, and, and including Nova Scotia, land taken by Massachusetts troops in their expedition had to be returned to France, which was did not sit well with the colonists. And if we go to our next slide, you can see kind of a map of how sprawling this conflict was, uh, mostly in the area from Boston and Albany toward Quebec. And you can see uh, the red uh, arrow signify British and or American offensives and the blue uh, signify uh, French and Indian offensives also. But this, this conflict was largely um, uh, limited to New England, the Canadian Maritimes, and uh, what is now Quebec and Montreal. Okay, let's move on, please. And uh, this is an illust a contemporary illustration of the attack on Quebec by the Massachusetts troops, uh, they were not able to get on to uh, ad enough advantageous ground to be able to take the city. Um, this, uh, the city of Quebec actually comes into play again um, 69 years later during the French and Indian War. 
and the uh, America, the British and their and their allies would be a lot more successful. Okay, next, please. All right. Now the next uh, conflict that would be called one of these dynastic dynastic uh, conflicts was Queen Anne's War. Queen Anne was William the Third sister-in-law, and she uh, took the throne, and uh, almost immediately conflict erupted over the Spanish succession. And that's why it was called the War of the Spanish Succession. And what we mean by that is that uh, there was an opening in the um, uh, for the for the succession to the Spanish throne, and uh, many several of the European countries uh, uh, went to war over who should get the throne. And so the British uh, were allied with the Dutch, and the French were allied with Spain, and. This war became uh, really a lot more widespread, so that you also had you had the New York and the New England theater with numerous Indian raids, uh, in, in, in French inspired, uh, some led by French officers. The most famous one was the Deerfield raid in Deerfield, Massachusetts, in 1704, and in that raid, which was in the winter time. The uh, French and Indians attacked at night, and the uh, settlers had the colonists had become complacent uh, because between the end of the last war and the beginning of Queen Anne's War uh, were several years, and 53 uh, uh, Massachusetts colonists were killed, 111 were captured and by the Indians and taken to uh, Montreal and Quebec. Now, there was also a southern theater to this war, and that's because of the settlements of the of American colonists at Charlestown, now Charleston, South Carolina, and the uh, British, uh, excuse me, the Spanish settlement at St. Augustine. So there was some military action involved in that area, but nothing conclusive. Uh, the real winner out of this really was uh, Great Britain. Um, they acquired St. Kitts in the West Indies, uh, Newfoundland, which again was a, a great uh, fishing and fur type of um, uh, uh, trading area, um, Hudson Bay, again for the furs, and Gibraltar, which was the strategic position on the coast of Spain that juts out into the Mediterranean and controls the entrance to the Mediterranean. And uh, the, the um, that that small piece of property, mostly rock, uh, figured into a lot of British military history uh, for hundreds of years. So uh, again, the War of the Spanish Succession called Queen Anne's War in 1702. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, uh, on the right, you can see a map of the Deerfield uh, Massacre area. It's in the uh, top right hand side, of the, excuse me, left hand side of the map of Massachusetts. And the uh, French and Indians came from the north following the rivers and uh, launched that devastating attack. And while we're on the slide, you can also see at the bottom of the map on the bottom right, there's one of the red dots that says Mystic, and we talked about that um, in the uh, Pequot War earlier uh, in the presentation. Okay, let's see our next slide. Now, King George's War is a little bit confusing because it's part and part of or grew out of a conflict known as the War of Jenkins' Ear. Uh, what this whole period was from 1739 to 1748 uh, was part of the War of the Austrian Succession. Again, who was going to take over the Austrian throne when uh, when it became vacant? And also about land and um, territory, strategic positioning. And so this was known as the War of Austrian Succession, but since uh, this was King George on the throne at the time, it became known as King George's War. Again, um, 
that grew out of the War of Jenkins' Ear, which was from 1739. Uh, very briefly, uh, it was called that Jenkins' Ear because a an English ship captain showed up in London uh, before Parliament holding one of his ears that he claimed a Spanish uh, Navy admiral ordered to be sliced off and captured because they held him to be a pirate or something along those lines. Uh, this was uh, taken as gospel by, by the, by the uh, parliament, and uh, soon the war broke out between Britain and Spain, uh, and again, France and Britain as well in America. Uh, one of the theaters, again, was, uh, was South Carolina and Georgia against uh, the, the Spanish position in St. Augustine. Um, the, there was fighting back and forth. It was very hard, though, uh, logistically to conduct military operations along that coastline between St. Augustine and uh, Georgia, which um, uh, several, there were several forts along the Georgia coast that belonged to the British and into South Carolina. And um, because uh, of the swampy terrain, uh, lack of proper shipping, uh, it was a logistical nightmare, uh, but there were some uh, successes and defeats for the British and the Spanish, uh, particularly in attacks on St. Augustine. Now, there were also Indian allies on both sides. Uh, one of the, one of the um, there was very little territorial gain on this, but one of the interesting factors that, again, led to uh, a lot of uh, hard feelings between New England colonists and the British is that the uh, New England uh, was able, particularly in Massachusetts, to um, create a pretty big force of about 5,000 soldiers uh, with shipping to be able to uh, launch an attack on Fortress Louisbourg, um, which is uh, kind of guards the mouth of the St. Lawrence. And they launched a successful attack and siege uh, which was quite unusual for a, uh, almost a completely colonial force to capture a very large fort that, that was a French position. However, in all of the European negotiations and, and dipl diplomacy to end this conflict, uh, you had to give up some stuff and you had to, in order to gain some stuff. And one of the things that the uh, British decided was a, uh, chess piece that they could lose was the recently captured Fortress Louis Louisbourg, which uh, very much uh, made the New England troops, uh, the people who paid for it, the people who, the families who, who lost uh, soldiers are very disgruntled with, with that, with the British in that. So I mean, I'm sure you can see why. Okay, um, the next slide, please. Okay, one of the other interesting aspects or, or features of uh, King uh, of the War of Jenkins' year, um, after it was, it was determined, however truthfully or not, by the British Parliament, that uh, Spain had attacked one of its ships, in 1741, they, the British launched a, what we would call a joint operation or a combined operation with the Navy and the, uh, the British Army and American troops uh, on Cartagena, which is uh, was considered to be on what was called the Spanish Main. You see that written all the time um, in histories of that period. That's basically the coast of modern day Colombia. And Cartagena uh, was a very strong port uh, defended by Spanish fortifications and troops. And one of the ideas that the uh, British and American leaders uh, decided on was to create a, an American regiment, a regiment purely raised in the colonies, uh, led by American and some other foreign officers, some British officers. And these would uh, be led by Virginia Governor Gooch. And it was usually known as Gooch's Regiment or Gooch's American Regiment. And they actually raised um, uh, several thousand troops. And uh, the troops were, were sent by sea to the theater 
but they were kept on the ships for a long time while there was a kind of a, a siege with uh, naval ships, bombardments. And between the voyage from the colonies and the trip to the uh, coast of South America, uh, thousands of the uh, American troops got sick and, and died in that theater without ever having done any military service. And for example, um, North Carolina raised several hundred troops. Uh, only 15 or 20 uh, made it back to Wilmington when the war was over. Uh, it, it put a very uh, sour taste in the mouth of, of a lot of Americans that the British did not regard American lives as worth anything, uh, that they kept them on board too long, uh, didn't care that they knew that there were diseases such as fever and scurvy. Um, but one of the American officers who served in this campaign was Lawrence Washington, the older half-brother of George Washington. And since he was an officer, he had better quarters, better food, and wound up becoming uh, very uh, close with uh, Admiral Edward Vernon, who, who was an overall command of this expedition. And that's why he decided to name uh, his estate in Fairfax County, Virginia, Mount Vernon, after Admiral Edward Vernon. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. This is a contemporaneous uh, uh, capture, uh, image of the capture of, of Louisbourg in 1745. You can see that it was a siege uh, of the port and the extensive fortifications. And Louisbourg would come to feature again in the last of the colonial uh, conflicts of a major scale uh, known as the French and Indian War. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And we're going to talk about the French and Indian War in America in 1754 to 63. And again, this was known as the Seven Years War uh, in Europe, even though in America it lasted nine years. That's always a good trick question to ask students, uh, how long did the Seven Years War last and see if any of them have read the, read the assignment. So let's move on and we'll get, we'll get some of the basic details. Um, this map uh, shows the extent of the Northern Theater. There was also a Southern Theater uh, in North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, particularly against the uh, Cherokee Indians of the backcountry and uh, Southern Appalachian Mountains. Uh, but most of the British and American effort was, <clears throat> excuse me, was in the North. And I'm only gonna talk about a, a few of these campaigns. Um, if you look on the map, you can see uh, on the bottom left, two blue uh, cross swords, one on top of the other. And the top one, <coughs> excuse me, represents Fort Duquesne, which was a French fort at the, uh, at the uh, forks of the Ohio River, where the Ohio River begins. And that later uh, became Pittsburgh. So that's where it was. But in between uh, Virginia, particularly uh, Alexandria, Williamsburg, uh, but, but mostly uh, Alexandria, it was, it was very difficult terrain. Uh, once you got past Winchester, Virginia, very few settlements, uh, mountainous, uh, there, there was a lot of road building and was needed. And, and George Washington uh, spent almost all of his French and Indian War experience uh, in, in three different campaigns to capture those forks uh, at Fort Duquesne uh, in 1754, 1755, and 1758. The most famous one was probably uh, his involvement with Braddock's campaign. And uh, that was General Edward Braddock, who led a force of British regulars uh, through all that territory, uh, but was eventually defeated. Uh, most of his forces killed and wounded uh, and about eight miles from the fort. Uh, Washington was involved in the last campaign against uh, Pittsburgh, um, uh, Fort Duquesne, 1758, which was successful. And the British renamed the fort Fort Pitt and uh, built a much stronger uh, experience. But that was in that in the area between Alexandria, uh, Winchester, and then up to what's now Pittsburgh. 
Um, several other major campaigns uh, in were in the uh, uh, Lake Champlain, Lake George, Hudson River corridor. Uh, that was mostly a water route with some portages, but uh, uh, very convenient to go north and south. Um, the famous incident of the massacre of the garrison at Fort William Henry that's made made famous by the book, The Last of the Mohegans, that was uh, at Lake George, 1756. Uh, the French won quite a number of victories uh, up until the um, 1758 when the tide seemed to turn. Uh, there was a successful attack and capture in 1758 uh, in the top right hand part of this map where it says Louisbourg. Uh, this time Louisbourg was successfully captured uh, by the British um, and some New England militia. And of course the last major battle uh, was in 1759 at Quebec where the British under uh, General James Wolfe uh, left Louisbourg and uh, sailed into the St. Lawrence River, and after a difficult uh, several week campaign, they finally were able to get into a position and a battle was held, uh, a battle was, was fought outside of the city walls where both the French commander Montcalm and the British commander Wolfe were both mortally wounded in that battle. So that's kind of a good overview of the military action. Uh, of the French and Indian War. Can we go to the next slide? So again, uh, these are some of the highlights. Um, the What really what was one of the more decisive moments was when William Pitt became the prime minister uh, in, in, in Great Britain and decided to uh, not only encourage colonial participation in a lot of these campaigns, but also to pay them for their service and their reimbursement, reimburse them for supplies. When that happened, they could pay the soldiers more, they could buy more supplies, and that added a lot to the success of colonial efforts to support the British war effort. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, as I, I mentioned all these, uh, I just wanted to make sure you all saw a very interesting um, uh, illustra uh, illustration of the British attack on Quebec that was done uh, very soon after the battle. And you can see the heights that the British had to attack up uh, onto the Plains of Abraham. And uh, the battle was fought between almost all British regulars and uh, French regulars and, and uh, colonial troops on the French part, uh, but it was a significant victory. Uh, for the British uh, at Quebec. All right, next slide, please. Okay, now coming out of the um, French and Indian War, the Brit Brit uh, France lost uh, almost all of Canada, uh, a few of its uh, West Indies uh, islands, and the British were, were wildly successful. Um, Spain, who had allied with France just at the wrong moment, had to lose Florida to the British. And the uh, British were uh, broke at the point at, the, at, the, at this point. They had spent um, uh, over a hundred million pounds sterling on the war, which also had a European aspect to it. Uh, on, uh, in, in Europe, uh, uh, theater in, in, uh, in India, the Philippines, it was a world war. But in America, once the French were uh, basically knocked out of Canada, the formerly friendly uh, Native Americans to the French now really did not have a benefactor and a supplier and a, and a trade partner anymore. But the British wanted to keep the colonists out of the Trans-Appalachian Ohio country. They had just spent uh, all this money on a war in America. They did not want to have a second war when land-hungry colonists were trying to go over the Allegheny Mountains uh, 
into what's now Ohio and Kentucky and stir up more trouble and cause another war. Um, but the colonists were dead set on uh, getting as much land as possible. Some of them had been awarded land because of their military service and conflict uh, ensued. Um, this led to uh, several conflicts uh, known in general as Pontiac's Rebellion, which was, which, uh, was uh, a, a fairly successful, initially, uh, Native American attack on uh, British posts in uh, Michigan, uh, Ohio, uh, what's, what's uh, now Pennsylvania, and uh, it was eventually put down, um, and uh, uh, peace was eventually kind of worked out with the weary, with the, both sides being weary. But within this conflict of Pontiac's rebellion, there were two uh, incidents and 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 more as well. But the two most fa famous were the Paxton riots and the Black Boys Rebellion. Both of these were in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Paxton riots were um, uh, against the uh, Pennsylvania officials that, uh, in 1764 uh, because it, it was near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, by the way, um, because the frontiersmen um, wanted revenge against Indians for Indian uh, attacks on settlements during Pontiac's Rebellion. Um, there was one in particular near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, where 20 uh, settlers were killed by uh, Conestoga Indians. And um, the, there were no, there were no um, prosecutions undertaken against the, uh, the um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the exact point here. In 1764, against the Paxton rioters, but this kind of was an initial, <laughs> excuse me, an initial Pennsylvania backcountry versus eastern part of the colony conflict, and uh, it's reminiscent of um, of Bacon's Rebellion. Um, but the the settlers also were upset that they did not have as much representation in the Pennsylvania legislature. So um, this was eventually. Uh, eventually 600 armed Pennsylvania backcountry frontiersmen marched on Philadelphia in early 1764 uh, to, to vent their anger at the, uh, at the assembly. And similar to that was the Black Boys Rebellion in Pennsylvania in 1764. Uh, and this was basically an armed uprising between citizens of the, the colony of Pennsylvania and the British Army um, from March to November of 1765. Um, and, and what sparked it was a, a wagon load of trade goods um, uh, destined for the Indians of the Ohio country uh, was discovered at a tavern in what's today Greencastle, Pennsylvania. And these trade goods included some gunpowder. Um, and it was an effort by the the colony to supply Indians uh, with um, uh, trade goods, with uh, uh, treaty goods, uh, to that. But the but the frontiersmen saw gunpowder and other 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 items going out to the Indians that they were constantly fighting with, and um, so they destroyed the uh, wagon train um, in the mountains and. Never really trusted the the govern the the governor, lieutenant governor, and, and the assembly uh, after that. Um, now, a a another conflict at this time that uh, is not really a war. Uh, it only saw one battle, but that was known as the War of the Regulation in North Carolina. And if you're interested in this, our speaker on Thursday night, which I'll tell you about in a second, uh, is uh, is a well-known authority on the War of the Regulation, uh, Marjolene Cars, uh, who will be talking about uh, about this uh, this incident. 
And basically, it was a ba- it was it was the settlers in the back country, small farmers, uh, folks who had just moved into North Carolina, and uh, the colonial elites on the East Coast, the uh, people who are huge landowners or merchants. Uh, they controlled the courts and title to land, and uh, began charging exorbitant fees to register land. Uh, they were abusing their power. Um, against the uh, small farmers and their families. And eventually it led to protests among the people in the back country, which led into uh, the uh, farmers uh, stopping the courts from proceeding, chasing out uh, folks that they felt were, were really in the wrong, uh, Edmund Fanning being the chief leader of that. And it eventually led to... Uh, uh, the regulators uh, collecting in in the field um, in armed groups of, of thousands of backcountry folks, uh, and the colony decided that they were going to uh, put this rebellion down. And the uh, the two sides met at the Battle of Alamance, which, uh, if you know North Carolina geography, it's close to Burlington, North Carolina. It's between um, Hillsboro and Greensboro. And the regulators, it was about an hour-long battle, but the uh, the regulators, the backcountry farmers, uh, they eventually lost the battle and fled. Uh, the, the colonial officials and the militia uh, captured some of their leaders, hanged six of them, and, and that really put down the rebellion. So the last one we'll talk about is Lord Dunmore's War. And we also have a presentation about Dunmore's War. Uh, tomorrow at 12 noon by Glenn Williams, uh, whose book on Dunmore's War is really the authoritative study, uh, came out about three years ago. Uh, he is an historian with the U.S. Army Center of Military History in Fort McNair. And this was uh, uh, in 1774, so it was right before Lexington and Concord. And it was a conflict between the, the colony of Virginia and the Shawnee and Mingo uh, American Indian nations. Uh, Lord Dunmore, um, John Murray, uh, Lord Dunmore, he was the governor of Virginia, and um, he wanted to, uh, basically the conflict resulted from increasing violence between uh, white settlers uh, who were moving into land south of the Ohio River, modern West Virginia, um, parts of southeastern Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and then the Native Americans who had rights to hunt there. And as a result of all these uh, attacks by settlers on Indian lands, it, it provoked the Indians to retaliate. And war, of course, was declared by uh, Virginia at Dunmore's behest uh, against and to, to pacify the hostile Indian bands. Uh, the war ended um, in October of 1774 at Virginia's victory at the Battle of Point Pleasant which is now in West Virginia on the, uh, on the Ohio River. And this really was the, the, the last of the major conflicts prior to the revolution. Okay, that concludes our presentation. Uh, I see we have some questions, and so I'm gonna try to get to those here. So please stand by. Um, let's see. Uh, font is a little small for my old eyes. Okay, when you mention control of trade as a source of conflict, are you talking about trade with Native Americans or with England? Great question. Let me clarify that. It was basically what was known as the Indian trade. That would be that would have been white Euro-Americans uh, who ventured into the backcountry uh, to trade with uh, Native American people uh, for uh, items that they would not have been able to produce on their own, particularly metal goods and firearms, uh, mirrors, things like that, in exchange for furs uh, that were, were valuable uh, to people in the colonies, but also uh, sent back as raw materials for manufacturing in uh, England. Thank you very much for that. Um, let's see, how much did the return of conquered territories, often conquered with colonial troops, contribute to the attitude which lay the foundations for the American Revolution? Well, I think a lot. 
It's a great question. Uh, there was a, a book published decades ago uh, by a historian, uh, Edward Leach, I think it was, on this very topic. And these kind of things um, really created this notion that the British were, that the British thought themselves superior, uh, that they didn't value American efforts. And remember, I, I mentioned earlier the 1745 capture of Louisbourg by almost an entirely New England colonial force, uh, if you can imagine the logistics in 1745 of getting 5,000 men and their weapons, their uniforms, their equipment, their food, their shelter, uh, a, a naval element to try to do that, and then successfully lay siege to a French-held fort, all to see it go for nothing. Um, I think it's easy to see why that would start to to increase that uh, animosity. So thank you for that question. Um, reference French priests pushing war or any of the Indian tribes Christianized. Oops, I lost that question. Bear with me here. I got to get back to it. Uh, by the priests, then fighting the Anglican English. So that did happen uh, in some instances, um, but a lot of the, a lot of what were called the so-called um, Christian Indians recognized that they needed to be near major French settlements uh, in order to be part of the French, the Catholic Church in France. Um, so there was a significant amount of of those um, uh, Catholic Christianized. Um, Indians uh, who who did not participate, uh, but there were several uh, priests in the colonial period, uh, particularly in the late 1600s, who actually led military expeditions against backcountry um, and rural frontier New England settlements. So there, that that absolutely is a it was a factor in in some of these conflicts. Um, let's see. So why didn't Bacon get punished for instigating a rebellion? A good question. It's very complex. Um, I can, if you if you want to contact me offline tomorrow, I can give you some great uh, uh, readings on that. Um, probably one of the major factors. He was still a he was still what's considered a gentleman, and um, he arguably did not rebel necessarily against the government itself, but was trying to use his troops to uh, make a point that um, the they were undefended in the um, back country. Uh, they were uh, desirous of getting more representation, things along those lines. But I can give you some uh, reading on that tomorrow if you'd like to contact. So uh, let's see. The musket on the Queen Anne's War slide. We just took those down. Uh, is that a musket on the Queen Anne's War slide? Yes. That is, I believe that, I, I believe that one is a match lock. Okay, what, at what point did the English colonists switch from match locks to flint locks? Okay, so, uh, just so that folks know um, what the difference is, they, they're both muskets, but it has to do with the ignition system to make the firearms fire. So a matchlock was a slow burning cord, um, a little smaller in diameter than a, than a cloth clothesline, uh, but it was, it was ignited, powder was put into the lock mechanism and the, the powder was ignited by being struck by the slow burning match. So that was very clumsy. It was very dangerous uh, to uh, those around you. And if you were uh, around supplies, particularly gunpowder, ammunition, things like that. So by the late 1600s, uh, there began this switch over to flint locks, which were also called fire locks. That ignition is uh, with a flint striking the steel 
uh, part of the lock mechanism to cause a spark and, and spark the musket to discharge. That's very basic, there's, there's, there's more to it than that. Um, they were safer. You did not have to have a burning match anymore. Um, the regiments uh, in the European theaters began to switch over that in the, by the 1680s, 1690s, not exactly sure when. Um, some of the British regiments, uh, English regiments at the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland in the 1689-90 uh, had already been issued that. So probably right around 1700 uh, was when that gradual switch over uh, would happen. Um, all right, during the entire period, did the English consider the Americans to be British? And conversely, did the Americans consider themselves to be British? I would say yes and yes. Um, certainly from the colonial uh, aspect, they did not really regard themselves as part of a separate America. Now, that's, that doesn't mean that they didn't look at themselves as American. But if you remember, uh, initially, the Americans wanted representation in the British Parliament. Uh, George Washington wanted a commission in the British Army. Um, most of the colonies actually had more in common, and particularly with regarding commerce with uh, the British than they did with each other. Uh, some of these co uh, some of these colonies were uh, were very uh, competitive with each other, uh, particularly Rhode Island. Um, but they they were not interested in in uh, in being uh, forming a collective. Uh, you might remember that that Benjamin Franklin. Uh, had the idea to have an American Union uh, and and call together uh, many of the colonies in Albany in 1754, called the Albany Congress to discuss uh, how much, how working together would be better for America, and uh, nothing really came of it. So uh, from the other side, the British looked at, uh, at Americans as as British colonists in America. They were they were the source of a lot of uh, commercial value, um, uh, particularly in the West Indies, but even the 13 colonies that originally became the United States, um, they were seen as overseas cousins um, to a large extent. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to it than that that probably can't go into tonight, but um, that is a good question I appreciate for it. Did the French call it the English and Indian War? Um, I do not know that answer. I would guess no, but uh, maybe I will try to look that up and um, maybe figure out a way to get that to you. Um, were atrocities always part of early colonial warfare, or was there a specific starting point? Well, going back to the initial settlements in America, Jamestown, Roanoke, uh, even the areas uh, uh, in the 15. 80s uh, in New England prior to Plymouth being founded, um, there was a there was a definite pattern of initially having good relation with Indians uh, who lived there on the coast and, and, and into the interior, and the Spanish saw this too even before that, um, but it almost always led to conquest, uh, warfare. Um, Native Americans were decimated by diseases, of course, but there seemed to be, a, it was a very brutal type of warfare. Um, others have written uh, about the New World uh, was where the, the uh, typical rules of warfare uh, were not honored, uh, especially among captives. Um, so I think that I think the brutality started from the beginning, and uh, certainly in the French and Indian War, and in aspects of the of the American Revolution as well. So, and uh, with that, I'll sign off, and I hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you.